Right, thanks a lot for the introduction. So uh, this is actually going to be a paper about right healing gaps such, an, such as Uber and Lyft. And our starting point is that this is a more efficient matching technology than tradi traditional taxis. There's some evidence in favor of this in Kramer and Kruger 2016. They showed that the utilization rate uh, by going from taxis to a market such as Uber goes up by somewhere between 30 and 50%. This is basically the fraction of the time that a driver is working that there's a passenger in the back seat. And from this, we can conclude that there is potentially a very large welfare gain by going from taxi markets into, into ride-hailing markets. So, but the main thing is that in order to get this large welfare gain, uh, these platforms need to get their market design right. And there's a couple of issues here. Uh, some of them, there's two challenges. First one, uh, the first one is to get to do the matching between passengers and drivers the right way. And the second one is how to do pricing, and specifically whether to do dynamic or search pricing or not. So what, in this paper, we're going to touch both of these issues. Issues We're going to show that search pricing is going to be solve a matching failure that takes place in this market. So our main research question is going to be, how important is search pricing in these markets? Is it simply a desirable, a nice feature that these markets have, or is it instead an essential feature without which, without which they wouldn't have been able to be as successful as they are? And our, our conclusion is going to arise from this key observation, which is that ride hailing systems are prone, prone to what we call wild goose chases. Of course, you're wondering what we, what we mean by this. I'm going to spend half of the presentation explaining this. But just as a very quick preview, this is a matching failure that takes place when there are too many ride requests in this market. And its characteristic feature is that drivers spend most of their time picking up passengers that are very far away from them, instead of taking passengers to their destination. Now, whenever this happens, this is going to lead to a market collapse and a very huge drop in welfare. And of course, this means that this is a very undesirable situation that the platform would like to avoid. Mm, okay, now what this leads to is to the following market design issue. All of these platforms need to have some tool in order to avoid ever getting into, wild, into these wild goose chases. And I'm going to show you why. These wild goose chases can be avoided by, by setting higher prices. And this leads to the conclusion that there are two different ways in which, which these platforms can avoid them using prices. First, if they don't do search pricing, what they would have to do is to set high prices at all times. And the other possibility is to do search pricing, set high prices at times of high demand, but also being able to lower prices at times of low demand. So one of the key reasons why Uber has been so successful is the fact that they, can, they have a service that is cheaper than traditional taxis. So this has only been possible because of the fact that they have done search pricing. And this, therefore, we're going to conclude that search pricing has been an essential feature to Uber's success. So let me just tell you quickly what our contribution is. The first part is that we highlight this problem of wild goose chases in red hailing. And uh, we do this through theory and empirics. And I don't want to claim that we're the first to, to talk about this because actually in 1996 Arnott talked about this, this problem, this matching failure. But the main goal of his paper was to find what's the optimal pricing in a, in a taxi dispatch system. And he just found that this solution is Pareto dominated, so he just dismissed it. The reason we think it's very important to analyze it is because it's very important to understand it in order to be able to avoid it. The second main part of our contribution is that we point out the importance of search pricing in order to avoid wild goose chases. And this is going to lead to our main conclusion that search, search pricing is an essential feature of right hailing. Now let me go to the model. The first part, part of this model is that is demand. Uh, in, this, in this model, the platform just sets some price P. And then this market is not going to clear through prices. Instead, it's going to clear through waiting times. So this demand function, which is, depends on the, the whole curve depends on the price that is set, is a decreasing function of waiting times. Uh, and the reason for that is the longer you have to wait, the longer people have to wait, the less people would like to request trips. So then this demand function looks like a, like a usual demand function, but the clearing variable in the vertical axis is going to be time instead of price. The second part of this market is going to be labor supply. It's, it's going to tell us how many drivers are willing to work at any given time. It's going to be given by this function, which is a, which is a function of prices and quantities, and it's increasing in both of them. So the reason for that is if, there, if prices are higher or if there's a larger number of trips, that means that the, poten that the potential earnings for drivers are going to be higher, which means that more drivers would, be, would want to be in the road working. Uh, then we have this number of drivers working, but we, want, we need to translate this into the number of trips that are actually supplied in this trip. And in order to do this, 
We need this function that I'm going to define in the next, that I'm going to explain how it looks like in the next slide, uh, which tells us given some waiting time and given some number of drivers working, how much, how many trips can this, this driver supply. Before going to the way it looks for, for Uber, let me explain you quickly how, we, how it looks like for taxi markets, because it's much simpler. So this is going to be an increasing function of waiting times, and the intuition for this is, suppose that we're at a point like this one and we want to decrease waiting times. In order to do that, we need to have more idle drivers, and the reason for that is, if you're standing on the street and there's more, more, dri more taxis uh, driving through the streets, then you have to wait less time in order to get, to get a trip if there's a la large number of taxis on the street. Therefore, uh, you, in order to decrease waiting times, you need more idle drivers, and that means that there's going to be less, re less busy drivers remaining, basically less drivers that could take passengers to their destination. So then if you want to go down, you also have to go to the left, and th that explains why this is an increasing function. Now, once we have this function, if we just plot and put on top of this the demand function, the equilibrium is going to be over here, and it, this looks almost like a normal market, except for the fact that we have times instead of prices in the vertical axis. Now, what happens for Uber is very different. First, there's this initial, uh, for low waiting times, this looks very similar to what happens with taxi markets. Uh, when we want to increase waiting times, if we want to decrease waiting times, we also need more idle drivers. But this is for a different reason. The reason is that, suppose that you open the app and you want to request a trip. If there's a very large number of idle drivers around you, that means that most likely the nearest driver to you is going to be very close and you won't have to wait for a long time. So then what this means is that to decrease waiting times you need more idle drivers on the streets and this means that there's going to remain less busy drivers to take passengers to their destination and this is going to decrease the capacity of the market. However, there's a second effect that is going to, to be important for, ta for, for Uber and it's going to start kicking in for higher waiting times. And it arises from the fact that this waiting time is exactly the same time that a driver has to spend picking up. Basically, if you have to wait five minutes for a driver to be to pick you up, that means that some driver had to spend five minutes picking you up, and those were five minutes that this driver couldn't spend taking a passenger to the destination. And this means in the end that as you increase waiting times, there's going to be less driver time available to take passengers to their destination, which decreases the capacity of the market. So this, as this effect starts to kick in, this curve starts to bend, back, bend backwards until at some point it, actu it actually becomes a decreasing function. And we can take this logic to the, to, to, to the limit, and as the waiting time becomes infinity, this means that all, that all of the times that drivers spend working is going to be spent taking, uh, picking up passengers instead of taking them to their destination, and the capacity of the market will end up being zero. So whenever we're in this, in this red region over here, uh, we're gonna call this a wild goose chase. The reason for that is that what's going on is that drivers end up in this futile search for passengers that are far away from them, and that drastically reduces the capacity of the market. Now, let me talk quickly about, uh, about welfare in this situation. So, uh, if we want to choose a point along the supply curve, uh, suppose that then we're in this blue region, then there's going to be a trade-off. The reason is that if we start moving to the right, we're going to increase the number of trips that we serve, but at the same time, we're going to increase waiting times. So it's not clear whether this is good or bad. Once we get to this red region over here, there's no longer going to be a trade-off. Because as we increase waiting times, that at the same time, we're going to decrease the number of trips that we serve, and this is unambiguously bad, so this means that we never want to be in this red region, and this platform would always like to be in a situation here on the blue region. Now, how does an equilibrium look like? Just for a second, I'm going to, to make an analysis for, for, a fixed late, for a fixed number of drivers working. This greatly simplifies the analysis, but the whole, the, our whole paper actually endogenizes the number of, dri of drivers that are working. In equilibrium, the number of drivers has to, sorry, the, the demand for trips has to be equal to the supply for trips, which means that once we plot on top of this the demand, wherever it crosses the supply function, that's going to be the equilibrium. Now, I drew it in a way such that it crosses in the blue region, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. Suppose, for instance, that from this situation, there's, there's a price decrease. As price decreases, then the supply, the demand function shifts out, outwards, like what I'm showing you over here. Then we start moving along the supply curve upwards, which means that initially we start increasing the number of trips that are served as this demand increases. But then at some point we reach, we reach the maximum, and then we start to request more trips from this market than it can serve. And in the end, this ends up decreasing the number of trips that are served in, in equilibrium. Basically, we put too much stress in the market, it's, it ends up being overburdened, and we end up having a wild goose chase. 
Now, if we think about the opposite logic, suppose that we start from a situation like this one, when we're in a wild goose chase, then a tool in order to avoid it is to just the increase prices. As we increase prices, our demand curve is going to shift towards the ori origin, and eventually it's going to leave to leave the red region and we end up having an equilibrium that is in the blue region where we would like it, like it to be. Let me tell you just one final thing about wild goose chases, which is that it's very easy to get into a market collapse once we endogenize labor. <coughs> so let's start from a wild goose chase equilibrium like this, this one over here, and suppose that there's a small exogenous demand increase. Then the demand curve moves, to, moves out, outwards, and before we, we look at what happens with labor, we move to an equilibrium somewhere like this. Now, let's see what happens once we endogenize labor and how this propagates through the, through the labor market. The first thing that happens is there was a decrease in the number of trips that take place in equilibrium, that, that take place, and as this number of trips decreases, the earnings by drivers are going to decrease as well. As their earnings decrease, that means that less drivers are going to be willing to work, and this means that the supply curve shifts inwards, so this new curve, this new dashed supply curve that we see over here. And then this means that our equilibrium is going to somewhere, move somewhere like here. Uh, and there's one key thing, which is that the change in quantities is going to be substantial. And that's because, of the, because both of these functions are decreasing, the angle at which they meet is going to be low. And that means that there's going to be a, a much lar larger change in the equilibrium quantity than how much it shifts to the left. And this is, the intuition for this is that there's a positive feedback cycle between supply and demand in this situation when they both are decreasing functions. But there's, this is not the, the whole story because there's a second feedback cycle over here, which is that we had a further decrease in the quantity which means that there's going to be even less earnings by drivers, which is going to further decrease the, the supply function, and then it's going to go further to the left. And we can go on and on with this logic until we finally reach one point, which is going to be the, the equilibrium in this market. So the second feedback cycle is that as we decrease the number of trips, earnings by, for drivers become lower, and then there's less drivers working, which means that the number of trips goes even further and so forth. So there's this very strong, there's, there's this, uh, there's, three speed, two feedback cycles that are together, and we end up having a very drastic decrease in quantities, which ends up, uh, which ends up leading to a market collapse as demand increases. And of course, this is, this is going to lead also to a huge decrease in welfare that we would like to avoid. So I'm going to show you later how this looks in terms of, wealth, of welfare. Right, let me show you very quickly some empirical evidence that this is not just some theoretical possibility we're talking about. This actually happens in reality. What I want to show is that supply has this kind of backward spending functional form. And there's just one caveat when we want to take this to the data, which is that this function is conditional on a fixed number of, dri of drivers working. But in the data, of course, the number of drivers working changes a lot. So what we do is that we split the whole sample into five quintals, depending on the number of drivers that are working. And, and once we do that, we get the following result. The data I'm showing you, this is for everything that happens for Uber in Manhattan between December 2016 and February 2017. And each observation in this database is going to be one 30-minute period in this longer period. What we have here on the horizontal axis is the actual number of trips that were completed, which is exactly what I showed before Q. And in the vertical axis, I have the log of the estimated time to arrival. Whenever you request a trip uh, and you're matched to a driver, uh, the Uber app show you, shows you what's the ETA, that's the one I'm, I'm plotting over here. And as we can see, for all of the quintals, we see that these functions start to increase initially, but then they start going down, which is evidence of this backwards bending supply curve. Now, let me show you what are the consequences this has for welfare. There's a complicated model with, with many details that I cannot tell you now, uh, but I'm happy to discuss it with anyone who's interested. Once we calibrate this whole model, we end up having this plot for welfare as a function of prices. So, as, uh, basically, price is going to be measured in terms of the search multiplier. If price is one, that means that this, the price is going to be set as, at Uber's base, base fare. And here, to the left of this line over here, we have the wild, wild goose chase region, which as I told you before, takes place when prices are low. The, the most striking feature that happens over here is that once we get to the wild goose chase region, we basically fall down a cliff and welfare goes almost down to zero immediately. Uh, and this is, the, the, this is the, this market collapse I have been talking about. And of course, this is a situation that we would like to avoid at all costs because of the very large decrease in welfare. Now, this has direct consequences for pricing. And in order to do that, to, to look at why, 
Let's suppose that this is a platform that maximizes welfare. The reason I do this is not because I believe that this is a, an altruistic company, it's because this is a platform that wants to maximize long-run profits uh, instead of, instead of short-run revenues. And this means that this is somewhat related to consumer satisfaction and to welfare. And this is a platform that, for simplicity, we're going to assume that it faces just two markets. The first one, the strong market, is everything that happens for Uber in Manhattan between 6 and 7 p.m. on weekdays. This is the time of highest demand. And the weak market is everything that happens between 11 a.m. and noon. This is the time of lowest demand. Mm. And I'm showing you here a plot similar to the one before, in which I'm, in which I'm showing you what, how high is welfare as a function of, of prices. And we see a couple of very similar things. The first one, the Walgos Chase regions take place when, the, when these lines are dashed, and they, all ha they both happen to the left. And there's also this cliff uh, once we get into the Walgos Chase region. Now, this Walgos Chase region happens much further to the, to the right for the strong market and, than for the weak market. And the intuition behind that is, I told you that, uh, that Walgos chases take place when there's a lot of stress in this market. And the strong market already had a very high demand, which means that this was already a market that was stressed. So we don't need to lower prices by that much in order to get into a wild goose chase. Now, suppose that this platform is allowed to set different prices for both of these platforms. So then the optimal prices that it's going to set are going to be this blue vertical line over here. And there's some yellow line, which is very hard to see over here. So those are the optimal prices that this platform would set if it's allowed to set two different prices in the two markets. But if it's only allowed to set one single price for both markets, what it's going to do is it's going to set it in this gray line over here. And the most striking feature is that it's almost exactly the same as the, as the yellow line, which was the optimum for the strong market when it was allowed to set two separate prices. Mm, and the, the reason for this is this platform, when it, only, when it can only set one price, it's going to maximize the sum of both of these functions. And since it's maximizing it, it doesn't want to fall down the cliff for the strong market. So therefore, it, it wants to be to the right of this cliff, which means that it's going to be very close to the optimum for the strong market. The main conclusion from this is if this platform needs to face more than one market, what it's going to do is it's going to set its price. If it, just has, if it can only set one price, it's going to be almost exactly the same as the one in the strongest market it's serving. So let me conclude this with a little bit of discussion. There exists this common notion among in, in the media for some regulators, which is that these platforms use surge pricing as a form of price gouging, uh, which hurts consumers. And if there was no surge pricing, the alternative would be that prices would always be low, maybe in the base fare that these, these platforms use. The story I'm telling you is very different. And it's that if there was no surge pricing, uh, these platforms definitely need to avoid wild goose chases because they don't want the number of trips to go down, and which decreases their revenues and their and welfare. In order to avoid them, what they have to do is to set high prices at all times. So if instead what we do is we allow them to do surge, surge pricing, what they're going to do is at times of high demand, they're still going to set high prices. But at, at times of low demand, they're going to be to be able to lower prices and serve these markets much better, which in the end is going to benefit riders. Right, so this is our, the main conclusion that we have from this paper. Thank you very much for your attention.